Well, I think uh, we're ready to start. I just want to say that uh, hello and welcome. My name is Jane Debevoice, and I'm the chair of Asia Art Archive, um, both in New York and Hong Kong. Thank you all very, very much for coming. I am thrilled to see you all here. Asia Art Archive is a nonprofit organization, both in Hong Kong, which is where our mothership, or I like to call my mothership, our mothership is located. Um, and we have an office here in New York. We're a nonprofit organization based um, there in both places. We are a library, a vast digital archive, and a platform for dialogue and debate around contemporary art, or what we like to call recent art, uh, from Asia, from and of Asia. We have a full program of activities um, that we organize that include workshops, panels, artist talks, like what we have today, and screenings. Um, in fact, this uh, program today is part of a screening program, and we're uh, delighted to be, uh, in a sense, inaugurating it with Tintin's work. Uh, tonight, I'm zooming in from New York, where I am delighted to be introducing this discussion with artist Tintin Wulia about her art practice in general, um, but with a focus on one work, A Thousand and One Martian Nights, which is a 19, uh, 2017 video work that premiered at the Venice Biennale. And this work is part of her ongoing research into Indonesian mass killings of 1965 and 66 and their reverberations over time and up to the present. As I said, this work debuted at the Venice Biennale and it was a site specific video and installation. And I think Tintin will talk about that a little bit today because obviously we can't have a site specific uh, installation um, on Zoom, but um, I think Tintin will discuss uh, what she uh, conceived of and um, did in Venice. I hope everyone has watched the full film. It's a 38 minute film. And so we won't be screening it today. This is an hour long program. Um, however, Tintin has uh, said and has approved that we keep it up through the weekend. So if you haven't seen it, you can see it after the uh, program. Or if you want to revisit it after Tintin um, talks about it, it will be open until or will be viewable on our website until Sunday evening. Now I would like to introduce the speakers. First of all, Tintin Wulia was born in Indonesia and is now based in Australia, where she is zooming in from to, uh, today. She's, it's very, very early in the morning, uh, Australia time. Her practice includes video, installation, performance, and public interventions, and often addresses socio-political issues, particularly around borders, identity, and suppressed histories. Much of her work uh, is interactive and participatory. Uh, Tintin Wulia represented Indonesia at the 57th Venice Biennale and in 2017, where, as I said before, she premiered the film that we're gonna see tonight and she's very, very widely shown um, and published um, as well. Karen, and for her, for, for her full, uh, for all her full, bio. Um, you can Google, but you can also, we're going to put it in the, um, in the chat uh, right now. So you can look at her full bio there. It's also on our website. Karen Strassler is professor of anthropology at CUNY Queens College and Graduate Center. Her research interests include photography, visual and media culture, violence, and historical memory in Indonesia. Her recent Book, demanding Images, Democracy, Mediation, and the Image Event in Indonesia, published in 2000, I mean, 2020, so just, just published last year, explores the political work of images in post-authoritarian 
Indonesia. And we are so delighted to be meeting you, Karen, for the first time. Tintin is an old friend um, who we've known, I've known her work longer than I've known her, but I've known her for quite a number of years. And I'm delighted to having you back <laughs> here in New York. Um, but uh, Karen, it's wonderful to know that one, you're a neighbor and two, to meet you. So um, this is an exciting, exciting event on a personal level as well as, as a professional. Now, before I pass the mic to uh, Tintin, I'm going to share some housekeeping notes. Uh, this event will be roughly one hour um, with time for Q&A. So if you have questions, you, the audience, and I welcome you to have questions. We're trying to make this as interactive as we can, given the Zoom format. Um, please put them in the Q&A and we will, um, Karen will uh, try to get as many, get to as many as she can, given the time constraints. This event is also being recorded, so if you want to see it again, we'll be posting the video um, on the AAA website within a few days, the video of this event. And as I said before, the film will be shown, will continue to be viewable on our website until Sunday, Sunday evening. We're all also live streaming this book, uh, this event um, on Facebook. So if you're watching from that platform, please feel free to comment on the live video with any questions and we'll relay them to um, uh, the speakers uh, during the Q&A. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Tintin. So delighted and wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Th thank you so much for, for coming. And thank you all to the audience um, as well. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, I'm, I'm very delighted to be here as well. Um, from Brisbane, Australia, um, the land of Viagra and Turbo people, and I would like to pay respect to um, elders past, present and emerging. Um, and um, uh, so today um, uh, I will be conversing with Karen Stressler, um, who um, I've, um, I've well, I've known um, Karen's work for quite a long time as well, but um, you know, uh, we've um, uh, met in person uh, just a few years ago, and um, I'm so happy to have Karen here um, to lead the conversation, actually. Um, and um, and I would I would really um, uh, recommend her her new book, uh, Demanding Images, as well as her other works, of course. Um, uh, I'm reading through demanding Im images and um, and just finding a lot to learn from there as well. Um, uh, image events and you know like uh, especially the context in Indonesia as well. Um, and welcome everyone. Uh, I can't really see you, but um, 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 I've uh, uh, well I've peeked through the the, the list of um, attendees and. Um, I've seen some uh, familiar names there. Um, so welcome and thank you so much for being part of this conversation today. Please uh, feel free to um, you know, um, send um, any messages anytime to the Q&A box. Um, and, um, and Karen, should we start? Yes, so thank you. Um, Welcome everybody, um, and thank you so much to Jane and Hillary and the Asia Art Archive for hosting this event. And I'm just delighted and honored to be here talking about Tintin's work and this incredible video. Um, we we thought that before we start hearing from Tintin um, about her work that maybe I should provide just a little bit of a historical background for people who may not be familiar with um, the, the um, historical context that this film is referencing. Um, and we also, uh, Tintin was very curious to know before even before we start talking, what your reactions to the film are. And so we thought that as I'm doing this historical, a uh, little bit of a historical background, um, maybe in the next few minutes, you could just, uh, we invite anyone in the audience and no matter who you are and what your relationship is to this work, um, to just put into the Q&A um, uh, just something about your immediate emotional response or, or sort of what it makes you think of um, when you watch the film, uh, or sorry, the video, because um, we'd really want to know what your impressions of it are sort of before 
we start unpacking it and discussing it. And so we thought that would be a really nice way to start by having you all just write, could be just a word, it could be a line, um, something. Unfortunately, we don't have a format where you can see each other's comments. So what we'll do is we'll pause and we'll sort of reflect them back to you and discuss them um, a little bit later on. So please go ahead if you're moved to um, just write something about what your experience of the, the video was. And meanwhile, I want to just uh, provide a little bit of context for a few things about the video that may have been um, unclear or confusing for people who don't know a lot about Indonesian history. Um, in October 1965, after uh, years of escalating tensions between sort of right-wing uh, forces, mostly uh, led by the military, and uh, more left-wing forces, particularly the very strong, very powerful Indonesian Communist Party, um, things sort of came to a head with an alleged coup attempt um, that was blamed on the Communist Party and became a pretext for a military takeover under General Suharto. Um, and casting blame for this event on the Communist Party, um, the, the army, the military, um, together with um, the assistance of civil society and religious groups, rounded people up, um, imprisoned and killed members of the Communist Party, leftists, and people who were just associated, you know, often in very sort of attenuated ways, um, or, or alleged to be sympathizers um, of the communists throughout the country. And it's estimated that about 500,000 people were killed um, in the period between 1965 and 67, even into 68. Um, Along with this, hundreds of thousands of people were imprisoned. And among those, there were about um, 12,000 men who were sent. Uh, and these were people who, had, were, who were never formally tried. Um, they were never actually charged with a crime. Um, they were sent to a prison camp on Buru Island um, that um, is probably best known by a lot of people because uh, Pramudia Anantatur was there and he, he composed his um, tetralogy about Indonesian uh, nationalist history while on the, um, you know, at, he told it orally to other prisoners. Um, the prisoners were referred to uh, by the government as settlers and they were forced to do very hard labor under, you know, just unbelievably horrible conditions. Um, clearing the jungle, building their own barracks, their own, basically building their own prison um, and turning the, the farmland, um, the land into farm in order to survive. And of course, many people did not survive. Um, when they were eventually freed, many of them, you know, more than a decade later, um, they continued to be marked as ex-prisoners and stigmatized and treated as pariahs in society. And it's important to note that the families of people who were killed and imprisoned were also stigmatized. Um, they were marked as unclean by the government, subject to various restrictions and treated with suspicion and contempt by many of their fellow citizens. Um, and finally, I just wanna say that there's mention in the video um, of um, uh, a film that a mother does not want her son to watch. And this is an allusion to the um, notorious propaganda film that was made in 1984 by the government in a very sort of documentary style um, that vividly and violently depicts the government's version of the events of the alleged coup. Um, and it paints communists as sort of treacherous monsters. Um, and all school children were forced to watch this mandatory film. Um, it was shown on TV every single year until the end of the Suharto regime in 1998. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there with the background and turn it back over to Tintin. Um, thank you so much, Karen. Um, uh, we would also like to um, dedicate this discussion to the late Teja Bayu, who played himself in the video. Um, Teja Bayu was a surviving political prisoner of Buru Island. Um, and a head librarian of the Indonesian Legal Aid Foundation and as a specialist of digital and physical security with the Institute for the Studies on Free Flow Information uh, that published underground media leading up to Suharto's fall in 1998. 
Um, he passed away um, quite recently in Jakarta um, at the age of 78 on um, the 25th of February to, uh, 2021. Um, Teja Bayu survived, is uh, survived by his wife Tuti Pujiati and two filmmaker sons um, and families, uh, Ratirikala Bre Aditya and Sandia Kala Wikan Ananta Brata. Um, thank you, Teja Bayu, for being part of our lives, and we will always miss you. So I think that um, people maybe are still processing and uh, we don't have, a, we have a few little comments here, but I'd, I'd love to gather more. So um, maybe we'll go ahead and start talking, or start our discussion, Tintin, and circle back to these um, impressions a little bit later in hopes that maybe a few more people add. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you to talk about the whole idea of Mars and, and where you came up with this, I think really brilliant, really wonderful idea of placing Buru prison on Mars. So maybe we could start with that. Yeah, well, um, thank you for that question. I mean, it's a, it's a short question, I think with a long answer. So I'll, uh, I'll just go through, uh, um, you know, like everything that comes up and, and I will get back to them, I guess, and in our conversation later. Um, I hope this will, you know, just lay out the sort of the, the base of it. Uh, but um, I, I actually always had a fascination with Mars. <laughs> and this fascination comes from my childhood, actually. Um, so when I was a child uh, in Denpasar in Bali, um, um, my father had this, you know, like typical small town, I guess, um, habit of, um, you know, like spontaneous driving. Um, and some evenings um, he would just say, you know, like, okay, let's go to the beach. You know? <laughs> um, and we would have a, a, a either 15 minutes or 30 minutes drive, depending on whether we went to Sanur or Kuta. So I don't know how, how, you know, how familiar you all are uh, with uh, Bali, but Bali is a very touristy, uh, touristic island. And these um, two beaches, especially that I mentioned, Sanur and Kuta, are now just you know packed of tourists but back then this was in the 70s so that back then it was quite different um but anyway so then when we we get to the beach the whole family meaning my siblings and I and my parents would just you know like um lie down on on the sand and look at the open sky and just spend the rest of the night stargazing basically uh, and sometimes my father would um, uh, tell us stories about um, his childhood in, uh, in the village in Bali. Um, but generally we would just um, stargaze and, and wonder about the universe, about space, about aliens <laughs> and about human life in general. Um, and these were, these were wonderings, right? So, so no, well, I mean, obviously no one of us was an astronomer. So there were lots of questions, but there were never any answers, just wonderings and imagining possibilities after possibilities while, while looking at the, the open sky, basically. So yeah, my, my Mars thing started that early in the 70s, which, is, uh, which was, of course, just right after the height of the space race. Right, I was born in the year the the uh, in the year the U.S. and um, Soviet finally started negotiating cooperation, um, and that was seven years after NASA successfully had the first flyby of Mars, uh, and that was also seven years after my father's family's uh, home was sacked and burned in Denpasar, uh, and my grandfather was taken away never returned. Uh, but I knew more about Mars, um, uh, I would say, uh, than about what happened to my family in, in, in 1965. Um, and I knew what steps would be required, for example, to colonize Mars, um, uh, that we'll have to terraform it first, right, to make it more habitable to humans, to Homo sapiens and its supporting 
um, ecology, of course. Um, and this is just like what the political prisoners in Pulau Buru was forced to do. Um, they were terraforming Buru, practically. Uh, and of course, there was this also, you know, like um, I grew up with this very influential Spielberg film, <laughs> E.T., which is finally, you know, like um, uh, later on, uh, um, uh, after the pr political prisoners were released <clears throat> um, uh, until 79, um, uh, they were called E.T., like ex tapol you know, so um, ex-political pr prisoner. Um, and uh, so, so cinema back then in Indonesia was monopolized and with Hollywood movies being, you know, the only options basically. Uh, but I did read some science fiction, um, Asimov's Foundation, for example, and Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Although I don't remember the details as much as I had to, you know, memorize other things such as, you know, um, uh, Super Samar, for example, the the uh, instruction that um, Sukarno was uh, supposed to actually give Suharto to, you know, like take care of the country or something like that, which later on we found that, you know, well, okay, it's actually the, the original was nowhere to be found. <laughs> and then, um, um, and also the national anthem that we have to sing every, every single Monday in an extended flag ceremony um, and, well, by the way, actually, I just found out from a curator that uh, who I'm working with um, that in the U.S. you actually have a similar thing, like this uh, pledge of allegiance um, to the flag or something, which is quite, you know, like amazing to think, you know, like this nation building efforts are everywhere. So um, anyway, so um, uh, if, if I was wondering about Mars, um, it was possible to imagine Mars because it was um, unlike 1965 for me. Uh, it, it's because um, what happened in 1965 was a family secret uh, while Mars was sort of in the public mind, right? So I always feel like this family secret is like a lockbox kept very close to our hearts, very intimate, but inaccessible. Um, also because uh, for the state, 1965 was a solitary truth that couldn't be questioned. Um, so the state had the monopoly on its imagination, basically. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm telling you these stories partly to illustrate how my processes are very um, sort of vigorous. Um, uh, so it is hard for me to pinpoint exactly where the idea came from. Right? So it just comes from all over the place, what I felt, people I've met and talked to, what I've read, what I've heard and seen, and other, you know, um, sensorial inputs, including, you know, like the feelings and stuff. Uh, but what I know is that when I start, when I started, for example, preparing uh, for a, a thousand and one Martian nights, um, as always, I start with a set of assignments and that's how I, I work in a way. Perhaps this is where my music composition and architecture training comes in as well. Um, I would assign myself a limitation. Uh, and in this case, it comes from thinking about timelines, comparing timelines at first. I've been thinking for a long time about 1965 as a place that is um, inaccessible. And because it's in the past, that place is inaccessible because the past is unchangeable somehow. Um, so what if I place 1965 in the future? This was the start of the, my assignment um, and everything else followed. I, I had never thought about ET and <laughs> Extapo. Like that is just amazing. And, you know, you said something about the state having a monopoly on imagination or trying to, but of course it didn't, right? And you are such a great example and this work is such a great example of, of the power of imagination to, to move beyond what is offered. Um, and I, I wanted to um, push a little further to ask you, you know, there's obviously a long tradition of um, using 
uh, fiction and and um, using science fiction particularly right as critical commentary and to comment on the present um, or on the past as in this case of violence and oppression and it's so interesting how you use Mars as a metaphor for that um, but it's also you know you're making a very specific historical reference right you just talked about timeline right um, to the actual history of the space race and this convergence of the sort of height of American imperialism, which you know the space race is like the glorification of that, um, but of course the the profound underbelly of American imperialism was playing out in Southeast Asia um, at this time, right? And um, so you you suggestively also juxtapose U.S. Uh, military power and uh, Cold War politics uh, with what was happening in Indonesia. So I wanted you to maybe talk about um, what it means to put 1965 into this historical context. Right, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, well, this assignment that I mentioned um, uh, of placing 1965 in the future um, is a start, was the start, but not the only limitation, of course. Um, there is also the fact um, that this was something intended to be part of a solo pavilion that represents Indonesia at the Venice Biennial. Uh, and I'm fully aware that Indonesia is this one of, you know, like almost 200 countries in the world, um, 70 something of which um, would have a, a pavilion in the biennial. Um, so I wanted to contribute something of Indonesia that speaks globally as well. Um, uh, it is very much understandable that the Indonesian 1965-66 mass killings is uh, seen as a specific Indonesian thing, of course. Uh, my Indonesianers uh, and a lot of other people's Indonesianers is um, uh, something that's deeply rooted in 1965. Uh, the massacres were the first major rupture, this is how I see it, the first major rupture in Indonesia after the proclamation of independence in 1945, 20 years earlier, right? So somehow it's a major rupture of the dreams of Indonesia as a nation state. Uh, so even when there has been admirable efforts to bring 1965 Indonesia into international attention like uh, the International People, People's Tribunal of 1965 in 2015 in Den Haag. Um, so far, the mass killings have been an Indonesian thing, um, uh, which I think it shouldn't be. 1965 Indonesia is inseparable from the Cold War. We all know that, and perhaps even, even key maybe to how the Cold War had unfolded. Um, it's inseparable, for example, from what happened in 1973 in Chile as well. And in a lot of other places, even what happened inside the US in 1965. Um, and uh, I went to the Queensland State Archives here in Brisbane a few months ago, and also found some parallel histories, local histories of political persecution around the time. Um, although not to the scale of the Indonesian mass killings, and certainly not this, to the scale to, to the systematic Aboriginal erasing. And while I mentioned that, I would like to pay respect again to the traditional owners of the land. Um, but in principle, what I'm saying that is that um, the Indonesian mass killings of 1965-66 is not at all isolated. It's like a tip of an iceberg. Um, and then the next question for me was, um, how can I talk about one of the longest running emotional, political um, uh, and complicated issue, issues in Indonesia in a way that doesn't attract a banishment um, as well, um, either from the uh, banishment from the Indonesian public or the Indonesian government, both of which were stakeholders in the pavilion, of course. Then on the other side, the fear that some of the contributors to the, uh, this video work still keeps, which I understand very well because of my own fear, uh, which is perhaps irrational, but real fear that I had to face as well in the process. And 
And even right at this moment while I'm talking, you know, um, um, I'll have to acknowledge that for more than 30 years, 1965 has been a secret for me. So making something about 1965 has never been straightforward for me. There's a lot of going back and forth, like, you know, and, you know, trying to convince myself basically. Um, and 30 years is more than half of my life, by the way. Um, I'm not that old yet. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the contacts for me um, were, were very, very dense. And, um, um, and, and these that I, I um, just recounted just now I, I, um, um, are, are not all. But to return to your question, Karen, um, what does it mean uh, to put 65 into this global con context? Um, well, for me, this means to talk about 1965 as a human being, not about the others, um, not as an Indonesian or an Australian or an American, but as a human being first. And it's to recognize that as a human being, we're all complicit. Yeah, thank you. So, you said that um, making a film about 1965 has never been a straightforward thing for you. And I think one of the things that's so interesting about this film is that it is not straightforward at all. Um, it is so layered and it's so, um, it really challenges kind of the, the form and the, the conventions of the kind of documentary that we are expect to see about a human rights abuse, right? And we expect um, testimony and we do get very powerful testimony, but in this way that is also constantly sort of deconstructing and calling into question that directness, that, that apparent immediacy um, of the expose of the testimonial witness. And um, you do that through, of course, the, the science fiction, but also um, in the ways that uh, you have people telling stories that are not necessarily their own stories. So I wondered if um, you, could, you could talk about the way that you're sort of playing with and violating, but also uh, maybe expanding on or enhancing the conventions of, human rights kind of um, filmmaking and testimony and um, yeah, the conventions, the realist conventions that we're, we're led to expect. Yes, yeah. Uh, well, uh, um, yeah. Um, going back to what you said earlier, Karen, about um, a, a long tradition in literary art, especially to use science fiction as a commentary for social justice. Um, I guess there's a reason for that, um, which perhaps has to do with um, the nature of fairy, fairy tales as well. Um, uh, it's, it's making them more relatable, right? Uh, but also at the same time, when it's a science fiction, then it's a diff in a different setting. And, and, uh, and it's, it's uh, you know, uh, it's stripped down, the, the details are stripped down, but it gets to the basic. But then in, in, in science fiction, it's, it's being redressed up basically with other details that are imaginative. Um, um, and um, uh, it, it becomes sort of less painful um, uh, because they're more general, but, um, uh, but then they also speak to essential values as um, human beings. Um, and uh, uh, although I think, um, uh, Marsh, uh, a Thousand and One Martian Nights um, is a bit different. Um, before I go on though, um, I'd like to share, uh, well, Hillary actually, um, uh, would you be able to share the, uh, the links to some of the sources of the stories? Yeah, so um, uh, these are the stories that built up Mar um, A Thousand and One Martian Nights. Um, some stories were adapted from these amazing books by Hersri Setiawan and uh, the late, um, Teja Bayu, to whom we dedicate this screening and discussion today, and from 1965 Setiap Hari's social media channel. So please follow them and buy their books. Um, and um, to return to your question, Karen, um, 
I think Mar uh, a Martian Nights, um, a thousand and one Martian Nights is a bit different than a fairy tale or science fiction um, uh, because I'm not, I'm not trying to replace uh, documentations and records of survivors accounts um, with a kind of myth making like the state sanctioned compulsory film did. Um, and what I'm trying to do is instead to push these um, stories sort of forward and outwards. Um, um, in, in this case, uh, Mars functions as some kind of a surrogate, not a substitute, a surrogate um, of Buru Island and a connector to the NASA parallel at the same time. So there is um, also some kind of a lightness of placing 1965 in the future. It's not an attempt to fictionalize it. It's, it's rather a shift in the mind of the, the participants basically. And, and this is why the process is as valuable as the resulting whole. Uh, and it functions to de-fictionalize the whole thing as well. Um, um, showing that it is actually fabricated rather than trying to make it believable. Um, um, when, when, when I place uh, 1965 in the future, uh, memory, instead of being unquestionable and fixed in the past, becomes imaginative. Um, and something is out of place as well, which I hope not just the viewer's imagination as well. Great, thank you. And 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 you just brought up the, the participants, the viewers, and um, Jane in her introduction alluded to the fact that um, this was an installation. It wasn't just a, a, a video. Um, when you showed it at the Venice Biennale and, and um, you had it designed so that the pavilion actually was in two places, right? It was in Jakarta and in Venice. And um, you, you had a surveillance camera that meant that people watching in Jakarta could see at times people watching in Venice and vice versa, and they could also see themselves. Um, and so I wondered if you would, um, comment on why it was important to you to, to have this link between Jakarta and Venice and also how this aspect of the work um, that that includes the viewers in the piece is connected to your practice as an artist in general. Yeah, um, thanks. The, 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 um, the surveillance camera that captures um, viewers from behind basically when they're watching and basically mixes in their um, uh, live stream into the film. That's part of the nudging that I've just mentioned as well. In a way, it embraces the viewers and, and they have actually no choice other than realizing their, that their presence or absence made the piece whole. Um, um, to, um, and to connect this with my practice in general, and uh, also through what I've uh, what we touched on earlier, Karen, um, on complicity and challenging the convention of on of human rights documentary. I'd also like to bring in the work of a global ethics scholar, uh, Kirsten Ainley. Um, we'll have uh, references actually um, shared uh, at the end and also um, in the in the event page later. Uh, but um, Ainley says that there is a tendency in transitional justice that mechanisms of accountability are used to account for the past more than or to provide an account rather to, than to hold to account. So my question here is, um, if we want to go further than accounting for the past or to provide an account, how can art hold to account? So um, I've been exploring this in my work exactly through embracing viewers as participants like I've done here as well. And I think the, the function of art in politics is this, to embrace and engage what Walter Lippmann calls the phantom public and work in a way so that as much as possible, the public becomes insiders. And this is how I think art can hold to account and aesthetics is its power. Um, so this is also why it was important for me to not only show a representation of Indonesia to the global world but, uh, via Venice, but also to provide a mirror in Indonesia uh, because these were where the main stakeholders were. 
Um, so the whole pavilion was telematically connected like this. And the, the telematic idea actually develops from an older work, the butterfly generator. Um, and Hilary, would you please uh, put a link um, to a description? Yes, yeah, in the chat. So, so, so there is a cross-border connection. Okay, great. And, and maybe just to um, develop that further, <clears throat> borders have been uh, a very consistent theme in a lot of your work. Um, passports, questions of belonging, questions of unbelonging, citizenship, global citizenship, national citizenship. Um, so I wondered if you could maybe tell, I'm sure people would like to know a little bit more about that aspect of your work and where 1001 uh, Martian Nights sort of fits into this larger thematic that's been so important for you. Thank you. Um, I well, in my passport work, uh, recollection of togetherness. Um, it's an ongoing work where I make um, handmade handmade replicas of passports and exhibit them in stages. Um, there are mosquitoes swatted between the pages. So these mosquitoes are the links between the borders and Mars, <laughs> actually. Um, and uh, in 2009, I made this lecture performance called "Sustainability, Immortality, and the Nation States: A Short History of Mosquitoes." and an even shorter one of us. I included the script as an appendix in my PhD thesis in 2013. And uh, Hilary, would you um, uh, provide the link to that as well? Um, thank you. Uh, and I won't say too much about the lecture performance um, other than that mosquitoes connect colonialism with space expansion as well, including Mars missions. And you can just read it, you know, and uh, you can find it in the appendix in the PhD thesis. Uh, but to illustrate briefly with another example, um, James Cook's um, 1769 expedition to Tahiti also brought a mission to observe Venus and to explore the great unknown that turned out to be Australia, which they somehow claimed for the Great Britain in 1770. And then on their way back, they transited in Jakarta, Batavia back then, and lost a large number of their crew to malaria. Mm. So, well, I see the border as a system. So uh, one border is actually a, a meeting point between two or more nation states, right? So while it is separating the two or more nation states, it is actually a connecting site as well. Um, now to bring in what political scientist John Agnew calls the territorial trap, it will be in the reference list as well. Uh, the border between countries uh, makes us believe that borders exist only between countries. And this is also part of our, you know, like nation building, you know, um, imagination. Um, uh, uh, and so these borders, uh, which as um, the Portuguese uh, um, uh, author, um, Jose Saramago calls the lines that exist only in maps, um, uh, they become for us the only barometer of uh, border situations. But borders actually don't only exist between countries. The systems of borderings are actually pervasive and they are also decisive and formative of societal borders as well. In 1965, for example, to connect it back to that, Indonesia's outer borders never seem to change. But the rupture causes more uh, uh, major Segre segregation of the society. And this is similar to colonial times actually, where in some um, cities, the Dutch colonists segregated people based on arbit arbitrary categorization. But the state post 65 Indonesia had that segregation embedded socially and it's invisible, uh, like visually invisible. Uh, there are visual markers, of course, like um, you would um, uh, address in, in your book, Demanding Images, as well, uh, you know, about this image event going through these um, borders, the, uh, societal borders, um, that's how I see it. But there are, um, um, yeah, so, uh, and, and how this happened was that, you know, like through the killings, I mean, um, uh, there are indeed a lot you can do um, to a state if you start by killing people and instilling fear. Yeah, and I, I think that um, this question of, of fear and of um, 
inheriting that fear, right? So that second generation also um, that, that you're part of where you didn't directly experience it, but you grow up with these family secrets, you grow up with fear and shame and guilt and sorrow that you don't necessarily even really know the source of it um, is, um, or, or, and it's not speakable, right? So it's both invisible and unspeakable. Um, and you've, you've talked about in things that, you know, I've read that you've written and we've talked a little about this idea of affective thinking um, that really informs the, your work and how your work deals with these questions of memory and, um, and this sort of aftermaths of, of violence. Um, and so I'm wondering how you would um, could talk about how affective thinking informs this particular piece, uh, what that means to you, and also, again, maybe speaking a little bit about some of your other work as well. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I'll try, and um, I'm aware of the time, so <laughs> I'll try to make this uh, shorter as well. Um, so um, earlier I mentioned um, how placing 1965 in the future makes memory imaginative instead of being nailed to the past. Um, this gesture is something I've done a lot of in my work, uh, not necessarily to the future, but you know, like um, uh, elsewhere and um, elsewhere, basically. Um, uh, and I let affect and emotions lead the processes, but not closing all other sense and sens sensibilities when I make them. Uh, when I made my first works in the early 2000s, for example, this method was sort of established, uh, but, but back then I called them memories of feelings. Uh, it was some kind of memory, but instead of knowing what it was, I can only feel the emotions associated with it. Um, uh, and I'll share, uh, we'll share some links to works uh, that relate to the lasting and intergenerational effects of political violence. Um, there you go. Thank you, Hilary. Um, uh, and very, very recently, actually this year, uh, I found what uh, Rossi Draidotti calls writing from memory which I think is closest and quite, uh, can be quite helpful in, in uh, explaining what affective thinking uh, is, in, uh, especially in its use of affect. Uh, for Braidotti, writing from memory uh, is a part of her nomadic methodology. This is, um, uh, and, and can be explained um, through um, what her um, teacher, Gilles Deleuze, um, did when he wrote his two volume treatment of cinema without even watching the films again. So um, says Draidotti, in writing from memory, one is exempt from repeating the original source as though, and this is important, as though truth was never written. Uh, the rigor lies rather in being true to the effects. Uh, now the difference is, I think, between affective thinking and writing from memory is the existence of choice. Um, I don't think I had the choice um, to think about 1965 effectively, for example, because there's no facts that I can cling to. It's always, you know, like it's, it's like a shower of, you know, like um, intangible things, basically. Um, and on all the contexts I mentioned earlier for me were um, different streams of reasoning uh, interweaved as inputs, um, to a black box, as they call it in architecture design processes. It, it may sound like I'm in control because I can describe it or at least try to, but this is all retrospective actually. And, and because truth was um, never written, these memories of feelings encourage an, an extending, a finding of broader connections. So memory, instead of being fixed in the past, it's always imaginative, not only to the future, as I've mentioned, but also across time zones and elsewhere. So I'm also looking at the time and, and I know that there, I'm sure there are people who want to ask questions and I just wanted to give you a very quick opportunity to say something about the work that you're uh, embarking on, um, your new project protocols of killing um, and, and because it really leads right out of this idea of um, orienting to the future. Um, so maybe you could just really quickly and then we'll we'll try to get some of these questions in. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, the project um, proves uh, the connection between violence, distance, secrecy, and accountability, uh, looking at the ethics of future warfare. Um, it's, it's called the Protocols of Killings, 1965, Distance and the Ethics of Future Warfare. 
Um, and the idea is to draw aesthetic parallels between the protocols surrounding Indonesian 1965, 66 massacres and those of drone warfare technologies of the future. So the two cases, these two cases, like the killings, probably the world's most efficient covert action, right? And the current US led drone strikes and the technology that's being developed. Um, both are distant killings and both are shrouded in secrecy. But while data on drone warfare is limited, the recently declassified archive um, in 2018 of the 1964-68 uh, Jakarta US Embassy offers 30,000 page record, including inter-embassies dynamics that enable the 1965 killings. Uh, so I will look for patterns of group dynamics within the archives um, and translate this into embodied participatory performances uh, like singing or movements and um, to again engage the phantom public into being insiders. Uh, the translations will be workshop with uh, the public engaging survivor groups as facilitators. Thank you. Well, we <laughs> all look forward to what you do with that. I'm sure it will be incredible. Thank um, you. So in the, the time that we have, um, please, if you haven't put a question in, please go ahead and I will try now to, um, please forgive me if I, if I shorten your question or if I try to combine a couple of questions together just in the interest of efficiency. So um, there've been some questions about the music um, and about the, um, the playing of the piano, um, whether you're playing with your mother, that was a question and, and how this, um, the sound is working in, in the film. Um, and also uh, how it relates to this kind of question of intergenerational um, trauma and transmission of memory. Um, and, and in that same question, someone is also asking about um, the selection of subjects um, and how you chose to work not just with the survivors, but with their children as well. Um, and this person has remained anonymous. That's why I'm not, not using their name, but. Yeah, um, thank you for the question about um, uh, music. And, and that was my mother. <laughs> um, she is actually um, a music teacher. She's still teaching in Bali. Um, uh, she's, uh, yeah, um, she just had her vaccination. <laughs> so, and the second one is um, coming. But yeah, uh, uh, um, uh, the music is actually um, um, from, um, uh, you, you might, some of you might um, identify it. Um, it's, it's from Gustav Holt's um, Planets. And instead of um, playing Mars, which is, you know, like, you know, very uh, uh, energetic, um, uh, I chose to play Venus um, because well, because, um, uh, well, Venus and Mars is quite interesting, right? Venus is the twin of Earth. Uh, Mars is, you know, quite different. And um, it seems so hostile that it's actually more friendly than Venus. And so, you know, so, so, um, so yeah, so, so there's a play with that as well. And, and um, in, in the, well, the, the video is actually looped, right? So, so you, can, you can come in any time. Um, and uh, and depending on when you come in, uh, the the sort of uh, um, score to the video would either break down or being built up, basically. Um, and so um, um, <clears throat> uh, and I'll I'll just look at it through the breaking down. Um, uh, so basically, if if you see it when it's a score, then you know, like it's sort of in the background. You, um, <clears throat> I mean, this is the hope, at least, you know, like um, the intention that it's in the background and it basically like base you in this, you know, like um, and sometimes you know, like sometimes we we're not aware that there is music, but you know, like it's somehow. Um, uh, I mean the the perfume or the the fragrance fragrance of it is is all around basically uh, but then um uh, and uh like um through the interweaving of the stories 
it gets to really break down. And it, it, it was actually a true breakdown because I, could, I, um, I mean, I still couldn't really play that part. <laughs> so, um, um, so um, and, <clears throat> and it is an opportunity for me to actually share this uh, process with, um, with that I had um, um, uh, repeatedly with my mom. I mean, she she was not really my only teacher, so I had a lot of teachers. But you know, like um, I I know um, how she teaches, and um, I've you know I've had um, experiences with other teachers where you know, like for example, they actually teach biology, but actually you know in reality they teach life, um, and it's the same with uh, my mom as well, and. Uh, and it's a sort of also a, 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 a code, I would say, like, you know, a sort of what is it, um, a code, a mark um, of intergenerational um, transfer as well. And that's why to answer the other question about um, intergenerational uh, trauma and uh, share of stories, that's, that's also referring to that. I hope that's, yeah. um, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. And Shifting to a, to a somewhat different topic, there's a couple of questions that have to do with the Cold War context and with the sort of uh, broader Asian context. So um, Jihee Kim is asking about um, the, the coincidence of 1965 being a critical year in the relationship between Indonesia and North Korea. Um, she mentions um, Kim Il-sung visiting Indonesia and getting a, an orchid from the Bogor Botanical Gardens. Um, and uh, so then there's also a question from Rachel Cooper that is about this question of complicity and timelines and um, the, the um, what's going on in Burma right now or Myanmar right now with the um, artists who are being killed and arrested. And so this question of the, these sort of resonances and, and interconnections um, with other parts of Asia, I think maybe is something, I know you've done a piece about 1965. Uh, maybe you could talk about that. Um, yeah, which piece uh, are you- I'm talking about the, the paintings, the- um... Ah, yeah, yeah, the subtext. Yes, okay, yeah, yeah. great. <laughs> Sorry, I'm okay. Um, well, um, I'm, uh, thank you so much for that North Korea um, reference. It's, um, uh, this is just, an illustration of what you know like it's um uh the perfect illustration as well as rachel's comment um uh, on um you know uh burma and myanmar and complicity uh of that tip of the iceberg like 65 indonesia be, uh, being you know one of the tip of icebergs basically you know like there are tips of ice iceberg everywhere and i think they need to be connected um uh, and you know like it's it's um uh there needs to be more efforts to do that i think because you know um um uh, this is part of the bordering system right <laughs> um uh, to that 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 made made us uh, see things as you know like uh, specifically only isolated in one um uh, one location for example like indonesia is just you know like 65 indonesia is only indonesia's matter and not not other people's and you know um but uh, but um, there are a lot of um, other connections and, and uh, I have uh, started to explore it actually. Um, I, think to th uh, I think the one th a a Thousand and One Martian Nights uh, was actually uh, the beginning of a series of works where um, I addressed um, you know, these interconnections. Uh, Subtext of the Kawara's title, for example, it's, uh, it's one of them. It's, uh, it's in the chat, the link to that. Um, uh, and uh, so that is actually a, a response to, um, and this is, it's, it's quite amazing because I saw this um, uh, on Kawara piece in Washington, DC when I had a, a residency there. Uh, it, was, um, it was exhibited in, um, in an exhibition on uh, the Vietnam War, well, the American War in Vietnam, um, and uh, and I saw this piece. I've never seen it before. It's a triptych um, a painting of uh, 
and this is this is actually turned out this turned out to be the first um, conceptual work that Onkawara made, and this was before the date paintings, and it was made in 1965, and the, this um, it's it consists of three canvases. The middle one is 19 says 1965, really big, and that caught me. You know, imagine a, a conceptual work making you unsettled you know like it's it's really it's really powerful to me and i was like okay 65 and then the 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 left um uh, canvas says one thing and then the right canvas says vietnam and i was my reaction was you know like it was all but at the same time, it was some kind of, a, you know, like an annoyance thinking like, come on, Kawara knows that 65 is not just one thing. <laughs> you know? so, so then I responded to this, um, uh, this uh, work with um, uh, when I had a, a residency at uh, Davidson College in North Carolina um, after, after that um, incident and uh, basically um, uh, made 65 canvases of, you know, like in, in a work, but um, uh, so yeah, and, and other works like uh, Memory is Frail and Truth Brittle is also connecting, you know, like different um, stories, it's, it's um, uh, drawings, but also um, text. Um, yeah, uh, I think, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure whether that helps. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, what do you think, Karen? <laughs> I think it helps. I mean, I think what you're doing is um, mapping out some of these connections that, as you say, the, the these borders, right, have obscured um, a lot of that interconnection. And I think it goes beyond Asia, of course, if you look at the Jakarta method um, and this the new you know studies coming out that connect some of the um, operations going on in Asia with things happening in South America, right? I mean, this is a global history that that really needs to be excavated still. Yeah, um, and and sorry, and to connect it to the complicity um, thing that Rachel um, Cooper mentioned. Now, um, uh, it's really interesting. <laughs> I am, um, uh, so I started um, uh, talking with uh, potential partners for uh, protocols of killings already. And it's really interesting what it brings out actually, because in, uh, uh, in, each, of the, with, in each conversations with um, each potential partner, there is always, you know, like this uh, sort of, um, oh, by the way, uh, our country did this in Indonesia back then. <laughs> so, you know, like the complicity um, uh, issues come out and it's, it's a cross-border complicity. And so, um, so um, yeah, so I guess, you know, like um, when, when uh, borders, uh, when we are falling into this territorial trap, as uh, ACNEW says, you know, um, uh, it also actually obscures accountability and complicity and we tend to think oh you know like it's indonesians killing indonesians you know um uh, and a, a lot of other you know um uh, similar events in other places are actually you know um similar um and and uh, the question is also you know like uh uh well how far how far out complicity goes and how far back right so <laughs> yeah. So Karen, what do you think? Do you have one or two more questions you'd like to ask? Or I, I think I could mush a bunch of questions into one last question for Tintin if we have time. Sure. Why don't we take one last question and then I'll I'll come in and wrap up. But um it's okay. obviously been a thrilling, thrilling opportunity. And we I'm sure we could go on forever. Right. Um I so there have been a lot of questions about different um materials and elements in the film and the video. So um, from the the notebooks to the um, the clear plastic architectural sculpture, um, the NASA footage. And so I wonder if you could address these disparate questions by talking a little bit about um, what these different materials are are doing and how you came to um, put them together into this video. Uh huh. Yes. Um, uh, well, uh, the materials. <laughs> Go ahead. 
um, this is what I mean by, uh, I guess, different streams of, you know, limitations coming in. Uh, limitations and openings, of course, uh, they always hang together. Uh, but also, um, um, uh, so what you see in the video is actually um, um, a process of the pavilion being um, tested um, in Jakarta and, you know, um, and then built in, in, um, in uh, Venice and then also uh, uh, the other works. So there are three works in the pavilion actually, and they are interrelated somehow as well. Um, and, uh, but uh, the most transportable is actually the video because you know, like, well, this is, this is why we're actually <laughs> having, having this event because it's transportable. Um, the others are, um, you know, like physical um, uh, materials. Uh, the the perspects are actually um, uh, part of uh, an installation called "Not Alone," uh, and basically that's also in um, telematically inter inter network between Venice and Jakarta, and that's that's very visual and um, uh, it's responsive to you as well. Uh, and the other one is uh, a. a a sort of um, so so you go into this pavilion and you go up. There is a, a stairs going up, um, and uh, at the end of the uh, the top end of the stairs, you see just you know a, a door and a peeping hole, and the peeping hole um, gives you a visual, but then also uh, takes your the image of your eye, and uh, and streams it on the. What do you call that? The 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 monitors that uh, um, frame around around the stairs, and so um, uh, so there there is always this you know like um, uh, going back and forth, basically like circling and shuttling. I guess um, to borrow um, uh, Nikos Papa Papa Sergiadis's um, essay in the in the catalog, shuttling back and forth, um, uh, and also. Uh, to, to go back to um, the intergenerational, why the, the why the you know uh, the 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 choose uh, why I choose both the survivors of the genocide and their children? Well, it's sort of you know like it's the effect the impact is long lasting and it's spread over as well. Um, uh, but no one talks about it. Like you know, um, a lot of people are still fearful talking about it. Uh, but also, I guess, you know, like it's, it's sort of taking, placing 65 in the future um, and, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, and, 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 and thinking of that through the intergeneration um, transfer as well. So, yeah, uh, I guess I can, I, I think I, I can stop there. <laughs> I think it's so important though that you also do have that those those really tactile artifacts, right? Those notebooks and those that map and right these things that oh, still pull yeah. us back into that that actual history and moment. So it's not it's not just sort of an unmoored fantasy or yes, you know, yeah, it's really yeah. grounded in something, and what you continually remind us of that. Yeah, and also you know this this. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, refers to your work as well um, uh, on images, um, uh, Karen. It's, you know, like, uh, I mean, images are part of imagination as well, right? And, you know, like um, we, we project our imagination and it, it, it sort of, um, what, what do you call that, stimulates our imagination. And, um, and when we see a book and, and oh my God, uh, Teja Bayou's map, I remember seeing it for the first time and and feeling, you know, like all this whew, emotions coming out from it. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's that's and it's so fragile and he kept it all these years. It's just amazing. So yeah, so that's um, I mean, um, uh, I guess images have limitations on, you know, like um, portraying those things, but at the same time, it has openings as well. Well, I think on that note, I mean, I, you know, we have many people still here and many questions still coming in, but I think it's time that we wrap this up. Um, I can't tell you how how interesting this, this event has been, Tintin and Karen, your questions have been 
incredibly uh, stimulating and 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 uh, I think it's you know really brought a lot of these issues that embedded in this video um, to the surface and but just it your your video demands much more time and much more discussion and I look forward to uh, seeing it again and on that I'm going to say that the video will be available until Sunday night so please go out and see it again you can ask more questions um, and we've got lots of we can relay those questions back to you Tintin if you don't mind um, oh, that would be great yes yeah. many of the questions many of the responses um, in the Q&A um, uh, have not yet been answered and we'll make those available to you and to Karen um, if you don't mind um, and you know you can take your time to 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 mull them over and respond um, assuming that people leave their um, emails and anyway, it's just been a, a fabulous evening, really, really exciting. I'm, um, I'm delighted that we got so many people and so many people were so engaged. I'm delighted to see you both. Um, I thank you very, very much for doing this. So um, the way uh, with Zoom, it's kind of abrupt. We have to say goodbye, um, but goodbye. And thank you a million times. And um, we really look forward to continuing this conversation soon. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.